Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, so happy to have you all here for our fantastic webinar on uh, substance use and the umbrella project. Um, my name is Emily Ann Opala. I'm the knowledge and research lead at the Center for Innovation in Campus Mental Health. Um, and I, before we uh, do a little bit of housekeeping, I'd just like to make a brief land acknowledgement. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say that we're all viewing and participating in this webinar on traditional territories of Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, and we want to recognize their contributions to this place and express our gratitude for our ability to come together and learn today. Um, I'm coming to you all from Treaty 13 territory, which is also covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, um, and that represents the shared lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississauga, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and now many other First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Um, the thing that I always like to say when I um, do these land acknowledgements is I, I'd like to acknowledge that there are fights that are going on across Turtle Island right now, and there are um, Indigenous people who are uh, fighting for things like land, fighting for things like water, uh, fighting for things like missing and murdered Indigenous and Two-Spirit um, women. Um, uh, so I think as, as settlers on this land, it really behooves us to think about what we can do to support those fights. So um, thank you all for, for uh, your patience. Um, so I'm going to um, now go through just a couple housekeeping notes. So the first thing I wanna mention is um, that uh, this is a Zoom webinar. So you can see us, but we cannot see you unfortunately. Um, so if you don't see yourself, that's normal. Don't worry, don't panic. Um, you'll notice that there is closed captioning happening at the bottom of your screen. That's in order to make this uh, session as accessible as possible. However, if you find that distracting and you'd like to turn it off, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and turn off the captions for yourself. Uh, we do have a chat function available for you all today, and that's a really great place where you can share your thoughts and your uh, reactions to the presentation today. Um, if uh, you want to start off, a really great place to, to start would be to share, if you can, in the chat, um, what land you're coming to us from. Um, I'd love to see that from you all. Um, we also have a Q&A function which is available, so that's where you can submit your questions to our lovely panelist, um, and, uh, and that's where I'll be collecting all of those questions and then posing them um, to, uh, to Sarah at the end of the session. Um, so as I mentioned, questions will be occurring at the end, but feel free throughout the presentation to submit your questions. Um, and then the only other thing I'll mention is that at the end of this webinar, there will be a survey that goes out. Um, so we ask you to please take like three minutes to fill out that survey. It doesn't take very long at all. And we really do pay attention to um, the uh, feedback that we get in there. So please uh, take a moment to do that. Um, so now without further ado, I'd love to introduce to you all Sarah Crawford of the Umbrella Project. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Emily Ann for that nice land acknowledgement. Uh, yeah, please feel free to post in the chat where you are coming from. I'm currently in Ottawa, so I am uh, sitting on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin peoples. Uh, I also am from Algonquin College, so uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I I'm going to be sharing a presentation with you. Uh, make sure that you use a Q&A function uh, for any questions that you have. Um, if I see them coming through, I will be able to share as well or answer as we're going, but uh, we can also keep them to the end. So whatever works for you is fine. Um, but yeah, if there's something, just, just pop it in the chat. Um, I hope that today as we're going through, uh, this won't be like a little bit scary or daunting. It's just uh, my recommendation always just take small steps and start somewhere. And so, you know, we've had this project for um, almost seven years now, maybe even closer to eight. Um, I've been at the college for five and a half years. And so, you know, it, it took us a while to, to get all of these things that we've collected and started and we have. And so really just starting somewhere is something that that is my recommendation for you. 
Okay, so what is the umbrella project? So we decided to call our harm reduction and safer substance use project the umbrella project um, and give it an image. And so the idea is that when we're on campus, we can put this umbrella onto all types of things. We have them on uh, the welcome bags that we give our students that they can take to the grocery store. We put them on temporary tattoos. We put it on water bottles. We put it on all kinds of things. So the people are like, oh, that's the umbrella person or that's that person or that's this person. And they kind of remember like oh we've got that thing they might not always remember what it is but they've seen that and that kind of like triggers that memory in their brain um, and so that's actually been really helpful people kind of think it's cute and so they like it and they'll take our swag um, and so the umbrella project is about creating safer spaces on campus to talk about alcohol and other drugs and how they impact our students' lives. And we wanna really just focus on reducing any problematic effects that our students may experience. So it's very different than the traditional uh, drugs are bad, no means no programming that, um, that was happening in the past. Um, and really talks about how students, if they are gonna use, can do it in the safest way possible. Um, we do tons of different training and workshops um, and things like today in order to work with our and support our staff and students on campus. Um, and so our, our goals for the Umbrella Project um, is all about awareness um, and trying to reduce the amount of risks that our students are having. Um, we do lots of training with our employees and basically the whole goal is to create a community-based um, uh, referral pathway for anyone who wants to uh, be referred if they need. Um, and then we have like lots of links to on campus and off campus. So really, we're just talking about all of our students from any part points of using to no use to problematic substance use and all the students in between and how they can uh, use in the safest way possible. And if needed, we'll connect them with services. Um, and so we have a training online that people are able to take. These are just some of the highlights of it um, and kind of goes to the, the backbone of, of our, our training and of the whole program. So it's like all about understanding that substance use happens, um, that we don't just say no, and that we encourage students to access services. We have lots of fantastic services that I will highlight um, throughout this uh, webinar, but um, that we really want to link our students if they need with the services that we offer. Um, and so the reason that we do this uh, we participated in the uh, Natchez survey. These are the Canadian results. Um, and then this year we participated in the CPADS Canadian Post-Secondary Alcohol and Drug Harm Survey. Um, so I'm excited to see what those results are and, and to be able to compare them and, and continue doing that year by year. Um, but, but we're seeing that there are negative effects for our students who are using substances. So over a third of them did something they later regretted, a quarter forgot where they were. So like, and a quarter had unprotected sex. So even if we're just look at those three things, um, you know, these are the, the negative effects we want to reduce. Six and a half percent seriously considered suicide. So um, when they were under the influence of alcohol. So, you know, these are high numbers. And so that's really why our, pro our project isn't saying, oh, these numbers are high, so we should tell students to stop using. We're just saying, here's some ways that we can use safer. Um, and so when we talk about students and substance use, there's a lot of um, social normalization when we look at things like the media that tell us that everyone drinks and parties and uses substances at school, everyone's having sex and wild parties, and that's just part of the culture. Um, but in reality, we know that that's not really the case. And so we use a lot of the social norm marketing to say, um, we did a campaign called Think Again Thursday, think uh, everyone's using drugs, think again, only 15% of our students have done MDMA or, or whatever it is, right? So that's not actually the number, I just made it up. But, um, you know, so we're trying to change that and say that, that this isn't actually the reality that you think it is. Um, traditional marketing just says no means no and, and drugs are bad. And, and we really go beyond that. Um, and then this is one of the important things that we talk about with our students is that not all people who use substances have a problematic relationship with substances. And there's so much negativity around people who use alcohol and other drugs. And we just really want to highlight that lots of people use and it doesn't cause problems for them um, and that they don't have a problematic relationship with substances. And so we're really just trying to, to talk to our students, knowing that lots of them use and, and having these conversations. So uh, we like to talk about understanding why people use. Um, and so really it's exciting, helps connect coping and stress, uh, managing boredom, and also the biological reasons. So we have the neurotransmitters in our head that talk about uh, things like food, shelter, and sex. Those are all good. They make us feel good. They release endorphins. 
um, and, and they're good. But when we use alcohol and other drugs, depending which one we are using, they can release two to 10 times of the amount of dopamine um, that things such as eating and sex do. And so there are bi biological reasons why people use because it feels good, right? And so oftentimes when people come to us and talk about their substance use, we do a harm reduction consultation, which I'll talk a little bit about more about later. That's one of the first questions we ask is, um, what do you like about using substances? Because we have to know that in order to be able to say, how can we use them more safely, right? Um, and then there's lots of stages of use. So there's five different ones. There's no use, experimental, occasional, habitual, preoccupation, and harmful, and then uh, substance use disorder, which uh, used to be called addiction. And so we have students all the way along here, some who are never using, some who might use, you know, once or twice, but it's not really their thing. Um, some who use just when they're, you know, going out. Uh, some who use daily, but it's not causing harm. And so, uh, or it's not causing the, the substance use disorder, right? It, it's habitual. It could be a little bit harmful. Um, you know, they're using regularly, maybe daily, um, but but it's not really affecting their, their school or their education or their work or their relationships. Um, and then there's substance use disorder where people are saying, this is causing me problems. And uh, I want to, uh, maybe they don't want to get help. Maybe they do, but this is, is now causing me problems. Okay, so there's there's five different stages of use and we find our students all the way along. And so the whole point of the umbrella project is just to reduce the harm. Um, we focus a lot on reducing the problematic effects and there's lots of different ways that that happens already. So things like smart serve that, that bartenders and, and wait staff have to take um, are all to decrease public drunkenness. We have things like needle and syringe exchange programs, which are community level. Um, the smart serve is a, is a societal level that happens all across Ontario. And then like individual levels and, uh, you know, things like no smoking uh, zones at, at post-secondaries or um, around businesses, um, those would be like a, an individual business choice. And so all of these reduces harms. It's like things like seatbelts, right? Uh, we know there could still be an accident. We are reducing the harm by wearing seatbelts. We know it could rain, we bring an umbrella. And so that's the connection of the umbrella project is that it might rain, it's safer to take an umbrella um, and that, and we sort of apply that umbrella term for, for substances as well. So um, these are some of the questions that we regularly get asked and uh, our administration is fantastic. They're very supportive of the work that we're doing. Uh, our director was uh, one of the directors at um, uh, both uh, Rita Wood Addiction and Family Services and uh, other addiction services and treatment services in the past. So he's very well educated on this and very supportive and, and uh, has been very helpful uh, to our project. Um, but so other schools and, and sometimes student and staff will come and ask these questions. So um, harm reduction is opposite to abstinence and it conflicts with uh, substance use uh, abuse treatment. So things like AA and NA um, are the, the tra traditional methods that people are using. And we say that both are very important, right? Um, even harm reduction can be used in, in alcohol to non-mist with having those conversations with friends who aren't ready to use. Or if someone does uh, start using again, how can we say like, these are things to remember um, and that are important for you to know. And so they're, they're not actually one or the other. Um, different things work for different people. And so we have chosen to use harm reduction knowing that um, um, substance uh, abuse and just saying like abstinence only programs do not work for all of our students. A lot of our students want to experiment. They want to still drink. They want to still use substances. They just don't want the harms that come from it. And so that's the conversation we're having. Not all of our students are ready to say they don't want to use substance anymore because for some of them, they'll feel like they're missing out. Right. And so that's one of the things where harm reduction can be really great. Um, we've also got this question sometimes of like, you've got pamphlets with cannabis or whatever, uh, MDMA, Molly, uh, you're telling our students that they should be using drugs. And to that, we say that we know that our students are already using drugs. Not all of our students are using drugs. Not all of our students are using the many drugs that are on the market. Um, uh, but our students are using substances and that we want to talk about how we can do it safely. Um, but no one's picking up our pamphlet on, on doing safer cocaine and going out to decide to try cocaine, right? It's, it's one of those things of like, it, we're not telling people that they should do it. We're not encouraging it. And there's so much research to say that, that harm reduction is the best way for our students. But that's one of the questions you get asked regularly um, by people passing by. Um, and that harm reduction information pamphlets undermine the policies that say that students can't use drugs on the premises. And so 
Uh, yes, this, this is a reality that a lot of our schools have uh, no smoking rules or uh, we're not allowed to have massive quantities of drugs on us, depending what type of the drugs they are. Um, however, uh, we know that our students are still using drugs. So sure, they may not be able to have cannabis on campus or whatever the rules are on each campus. However, we know that they're still going to be using it. And so it's still really important for them to have the, the information accessible. Um, and then a harm reduction plan is just a way to decrease uh, the negative side effects. So there's four main ways that we do that. And each of our things that we're doing talks about these. So substitute uh, using other less harmful substances um, is one of the ways. Um, delaying, so spacing out our use. Um, so say someone you know used to smoke a joint every hour, um, instead try to get them to do it uh, every two hours or um, something like that, spacing it out instead. Uh, decreasing risk. So using smaller quantities or safer methods. So if you used to eat 100 milligrams of edible, maybe go down to 50. Or um, if you used to drink a whole 26er, maybe try and get a Mickey instead and see if, you know, that smaller size will be, um, you know, better for you. So that way you don't have more on hand. Um, or safer methods. So instead of using a bong every time uh, you spoke a joint, uh, why not? Or every, and every time you smoke cannabis, use a joint or vaporizer, something like that is the safer ways of using, um, inhaling versus injecting those types of things. Um, and then replacing substances. So getting the substances in other healthier ways, um, instead of funneling, slowly drinking your, your alcohol, right? Like those are some of the conversations that we're having with our students. We're not saying stop drinking. We're just saying that if you're going to funnel your Mickey of alcohol, you might get way too drunk and end up in the ER. Why not slowly drink it throughout the day and make it to the end of the party? Um, and then one of the things that has been really helpful for us is like it, leveraging our internal partnerships. And so we have our counseling services. We work very well with them. They provide all of our harm reduction consultations. A harm reduction consultation is uh, our students are seeing or staff or their professors or whoever is noticing a negative uh, effects of students using substances. Um, it could be the residents. Maybe they're running through the halls naked or some of the crazy stories that we've all heard. Um, and the student needs maybe some help. And so um, counseling services will provide a harm reduction consultation. They'll talk with the students about why they like using drugs. Um, is there anything that they think they could easily change? Uh, what, are, what are they hoping to be able to, to change with the outcomes? Um, and, and how can they manage those plans? And so uh, a lot of our counselors have come from the different uh, addiction services and treatment services. And so um, those two counselors who have that background are the one who provide those consultations. Um, it's something that you could easily look into. A lot of your counselors will already have that background and knowledge. Uh, and that could just be something that you offer on your pamphlet. The internal partnership with residents is fantastic. Um, the RAs are really great at being a catalyst for programming. I'm one person running this project. I also manage our sexual violence prevention project. Um, so I'm quite busy and it's just me. And so, you know, residents has been a fantastic resource and ally. Um, their RAs do a lot of our programming, especially around, you know, Halloween um, and St. Patrick's Day. They do lots of education and awareness and stuff. And so those are, are really great allies to have. We have a fantastic marketing team who will do all the cool things that I've shown. Um, and they are, are really great. So really just think, figuring out, like we've got all these partnerships here. It's really good for folks to figure out who they can leverage. Um, our student placements are, are the best thing that's ever happened to us because we get them to do all of our, our social media plans. They know what's cool. They know what students will like. Um, and so we, we have different ones doing our, our sexual violence ones. We've got different ones doing our substance use. We've got health ones and they come up with a whole plan for the year um, something to post each week or different themes um, and so there's things that yes you're one person doing a role and maybe you have like an hour or two a week to commit to this but you can leverage other folks to help and support with this um, department chairs and faculty are really great um, to have those like allies and, and to get those connections in so we did start from nowhere we don't have any funding for this anymore um, but we're still able to run this project because we've got um, a great website website. We've got our students being able to do this and go out and do this who are free to use. Um, and then we have so many good internal partnerships who are able to refer students um, to counseling services or give them our pamphlet or give them the information. Um, and so it doesn't take a lot to be able to actually uh, run this project. 
which I know is always a scary thing for folks. And, and if anyone has questions on this, I'm, I'm happy to answer them at the end and also um, connect later. Um, and then some of the highlights that we're able to do, we've got some online learning modules and I will send the links for those. We participated in the National College Health Assessment. We just participated in the CPADS. Uh, I run both projects, sexual violence prevention and the harm reduction project. So the Umbrella Project and Project Lighthouse work together to collaborate on a lot of projects because there is a big link between substance use and sexual violence. And so the harm reduction of one is harm reduction of the other. Um, we do the student consultations, again, the residence interventions. So one of our counselors um, is in our residence. Uh, she's a residence counselor. She's only there a few times a week. Um, and then she's in the main campus part of the week as well. Uh, but she will provide the the student um, consultations right in residence so students don't have to go far um, they can meet with their RLC um, with res managers and also her and have those conversations uh, we work with health promotion so they're able to go out and really uh, spread this information for us um, and then a lot of external partnerships um, we have them with CAPSA for all people all pathways they run our programming so we used to run something called smart recovery um, it's still an abstinence only program smart recovery and so a lot of our students didn't feel comfortable with it we've switched to all people all pathways through capsa um community addiction and peer support association i think i always get it wrong i'm pretty sure that's it um you can type in the chat i know ashley's here uh and so all people have pathways is, is so good. Um, they're not absence only. And so it's it's all people and it's all pathways and says it in the name. It's for students to come and explore the relationship with alcohol and other substances. They don't have to be abstinent, which is good for a lot of our students because they're not ready to be abstinent, right? A lot of our students don't want to miss out on those parties. They just want to be safer. They just want to talk to someone. And maybe having these conversations at some point, they will want to change the behavior and make decisions. But just knowing they have a place to talk to has been really good. We struggled to get people to come to Smart Recovery. We ran it for maybe five years. Sometimes we get one person a week. Sometimes we get no one. Um, All People with Pathways has, we've only run it since the pandemic. It's been just over a year, closer to a year and a half. Um, and our groups regularly have between like three and five people. And so for something running online, that's a lot more than we never had anyone before. Most of our weeks, we would like go to the room, wait, no one would be there. Um, and so this has been a lot better. Um, it has been online, so it's easier to access for our students. Um, we will see what things happen in September as well. Uh, we also run a thing called National Addiction Awareness Week. So it's just a way to have conversations. We plan events throughout the week. Um, we do a lot of stuff around Halloween and St. Patrick's Day because those are the high risk times. For Halloween, we do something called reverse trick-or-treating. So instead of students coming to us, we go to every single room and residence and hand out a little toolkit. Um, We've got these cute little, I didn't put them in, they're my favorite, I'll, I'll send you, I'll post, I'll share the screen at the end, but we've got these little postcards and they say, there's two different ones. If someone's like walking with a shuffle, slurring their words, um, they're either a zombie or they're unable to consent. And then on the back, it has like six ways that you can use safer. And then I've got the t-shirts coming up that, that has the tips, but we've got the tips for students to like, look, we have a fun, engaging way to do it. Um, but the really high times for our students to have problematic use is, is in orientation um, and then throughout uh, Halloween and St. Patrick's Day. So lots and lots and lots of programming goes into that. Um, these are our St. Patrick's Day t-shirts, um, the iClover Safer Shenanigans. And then on the back, I think you can see if I zoom in like that, um, they say what's happening here. So ate a great big St. Patrick's Day meal, um, had a good night's sleep beforehand, had a cup of water with every drink and saved myself a hangover. Trust in my gut, if something didn't feel safe, I listen. Exchanging numbers instead of hooking up. Wasted sex is risky. Um, my drinking buddy was also my get home safe buddy. We downloaded the Uber app. Um, so just like those little tips, oops, I zoomed out too far, but those little tips, it's not letting me zoom back in, there we are, uh, are just like a fun way for our students. We've had them both in green. We've also had them in uh, white with green writing and let the students decorate them. They both go over really well. They're like maybe five dollars each so if you have a pool of money they're like a great way to get our students to engage um we've done them as prizes and had like a big booth for um harm reduction week which we run the week before saint patrick's day we do a booth if they go to the six services that we have 
um, then they can get a t-shirt. And so we have to like make them work for it. They learn about the different services on and off campus. We have counseling services, the umbrella project. We have um, local addiction treatment centers. We've got our health services. We have um, also a relationship with one of our pharmacists who will give out naloxone kits as well. Um, and so just like really great ways to engage our students. And at the end, they get a t-shirt. Um, we've also done it with popcorn and candy. Basically students will work for anything and do anything. So I think to go to those places is, is a really great way to, to get that. And then we also have these um, safer substance use pamphlets. And so we partnered with uh, Here to Help um, through BC and we were able to make these. Um, if you are interested in having them, you would just have to contact Here to Help and make sure that they will let you adapt them. Um, otherwise, the only other thing you need to do is just get change these uh, information from the back. But we have one, uh, we have five different versions uh, and I'll kind of go through them. They're basically kind of say the same things, things to avoid, um, what to do if, if there's problems uh, before you start drinking or using the substance while you're using it. Um, what, what does the substances look like? So here we've got like standard drinks, um, things to think about if you're drinking, when to use no alcohol and, and how to limit the long-term effects. Um, so that's the one for alcohol. We've also got one for cocaine. Um, same sort of things, things to avoid. I, I'd actually say try to avoid. Um, I don't like to tell people what to do and not to do, but um, that seems like softer language. Uh, things to consider um, when you're using before you start. So we've got alcohol, cocaine, MDMA, and Molly. Um, talks a lot about overdose prevention in all of them, which is really good, especially because our drug supply is so tainted. Where to get help. Um, again, these are all on our website as well, so I will send the, the information for that. Um, safer tripping, so all about mushrooms, LSD, other hallucinogens, um, and so the information on that. And then we've got cannabis use as well. Um, so things to avoid like mixing other substances, how different strains work, um, what, what it looks like using, leaving tobacco out, um, the safest way to use is, is with a vaporizer or edibles, uh, start low, those kind of things. So each one has, has different harm reduction tips. These are so well received from our students because they come and they're like, wow, this is one of the only places I've ever been able to actually see someone talk about substances, right? Normally it's, it's you know, drinking is bad or drugs are bad. And so they'll come and they'll be like, wow, I'm going to take this for my friend or I'm going to take this for myself. It's always usually for the friend. Uh, and then the last questions and those kind of things. But it's really good. They take them. We go through like hundreds, no, thousands a year of these. And we're printing them all the time. And it's it's great. We also have them up on our website in a digital version. Um, and so it's really helpful for our students to be able to interact. We've also uh, been able to adapt some of these were posters originally from uh, CCSA. Uh, we adapted them into postcards and our students love these as well because they say the word cannabis and they're like, wow, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and so we've got like just helpful little tips about um, things to avoid mixing. So tobacco, other substances and alcohol. We've got one on however you use it, cannabis is cannabis, smoking, vaping, eating. Um, and then on the back uh, is the difference between inhaling and ingesting and sort of what happens to you through each stage. Um, the inhaling and ingesting and how you'll feel the effects when it will peak. Um, and that's a really good one. We have lots of like games around this as well. Um, you know, because a lot of our students get their cannabis from the Ontario cannabis store here in Ontario. However, um, we also know that a lot of our students will go online and order cannabis. Um, they will go to some of the local uh, reservations and get cannabis and they're not limited to 10 milligrams each. Um, and so therefore, it's really hard for students to know how much substances they're having. You know, one time I had a chocolate bar and had 10 milligrams. This time the chocolate bar is 300 milligrams or 500. And so really talking to our students about like looking at the label and then dosing as well and what that looks like. I ordered like a, I went to the Lego store, got some Lego and have like some fake chocolate bars for them to talk about like different doses and the different ways that they can eat and what those would look like and how much they're ingesting. Um, because the different types of cannabis bars are really 
different. Like going from basically two and a half milligrams a square to some of them are like a hundred milligrams a square. And, and, and that's a lot different. And we don't want our students to have negative effects, right? And so just really having these conversations is something that, that we find important. Um, these were also adapted, all of these postcards as well were adapted. And so talking about it, but recognizing that um, not all, all of our students do get their edibles from um, the, the regulated stores. And so something to remember, people are making things at home where they have no idea how much is in it. Um, and they're also getting them from, from online as well too. Okay. And then just things like this. So in residence uh, and, and throughout the college on all of our poster boards, we've got different ones of these they are like five feet wide by four feet high. Um, and there's different ones and then we rotate them around. Um, but they're just talk about all different things. We've got ones about mental health, sexual health, sexual violence, consent. Um, and this is one of our cannabis ones. So reducing your lung problem mental health and legal issues, um, things to consider, things to avoid, what the law says, because that's really important. It is legal. Um, so what the law says about cannabis. Now, this is obviously just for Ontario, but you could adapt it based on what the rules are where you live. Um, and then most to least harmful ways of, of using cannabis is also something important uh, to check out. Then one of the important things that we do as well, um, is that we work locally with one of our pharmacists. So uh, Mark Barnes is from naloxonecare.com um, and he's a fantastic resource for us because we are able to have him come in and train our students. So he runs uh, uh, naloxonecare.com and he also uh, works for uh, Respect RX Pharmacy. Um, and so he will come to campus and he's given out like over 7,000 naloxone kits in the last few years. To our students, he also uh, does online trainings and has for, uh, for our students. He is only able to um, give out uh, kits to residents in Ontario um, or for people who have, um, who are veterans or have their um, status card as well. Um, however, you could work with a local pharmacist, right? So he will come to our smaller rural campuses. We have three campuses, one in Ottawa has uh, 25 ish thousand students one in Pembroke has about 12,000 and our one in Perth has about three to 400 um, he comes to those campuses with us but before we knew him we just found local pharmacists and they would come give out kits have those conversations um, it's a barrier for our students to have to go to the pharmacist I've gone with our students before to show them how to do it um, and the pharmacist sometimes will ask some questions that they don't feel comfortable answering like why do you need this kit or or what do you need this for um, different provinces also have um, in Ontario, we have free naloxone. It's nasal naloxone. We're very blessed. I know places, uh, other provinces don't have that and territories don't have that. So we are very lucky in Ontario, but, but forming a relationship with our, and partnership with um, the pharmacists can be very helpful. Um, so that's something that I recommend as well. Um, and then one of the Wow, I flew through this. I thought I had so much more stuff to say, but uh, one of the other things that we've been able to do, um, and again, this is is did not cost us very much money. We paid some peer supporters. Um, we stopped using it over the summer, but um, throughout the school year, we don't have many students in the summer. Um, and we couldn't get it staffed as well in the summer, but we have placement and paid student staff run the beacon and the beacon is our health and wellness peer support space. It's all about um, health and wellness so students can come uh, have a conversation about sexual health mental health substance use addictions. Um, and that's something that we will refer students to other resources. Uh, they're not counselors, they're just doing peer support. So they're uh, mostly acting as referral and, and information access. They'll also refer students to our All People All Pathways that happens every Monday on our campus. Um, and so it's just really a great way. If you just use all placement students, it would be free as well to run. It doesn't take that much time. We have a physical space now. Um, we run it in a couple different ways. Students can drop in in real life. Uh, they can access it online through Teams or they can, we have anonymous text and chat line. It's $20 a month to run. Um, and people are able to access that way. They can text physically like through their cell phone or um, they can uh, type out their chat and, and that's all anonymous as well. So that's something else that, that we use to be able to um, work with our students. 
Um, one of the last things, like we do a lot of social media and I can send the links for those and people can check it out as well. But one of the last things that I think is, is really important um, for folks to be able to do, it's, it doesn't cost anything, it's super easy, is to just send a letter home um, to uh, guardians, caregivers, family, friends of the students entering residence. Um, so this is our letter here. It's half of it. There's half on the next page, but it's all about that you matter. You're important in your student's life. Um, when they're moving into residence, things to remember. Um, they're going to have a lot of different experiences, alcohol, sexual activity, maybe both. Um, it, we know it's not easy to have these conversations, but here's why it's important to do so, right? Those caregivers, family, friends, whoever it is bringing that person to post-secondary are such important key people and if they can have these conversations with them before they come it makes it easier for us to do it when we get there um and so you know we're talking about how much of our students are doing things um almost 80 percent have had one or less sexual partner uh over 75 percent of students had not used cannabis in the last month um and almost 60 percent of students drank once a month or less um and so we're really just trying to flip that that oh all of our students are drinking all the time and saying that actually that's not the reality and all of these facts are from our national college health Health assessment. Um, here's some ways that you can keep your, your young adults safe, um, have these conversations with them. And then on this part is like how to know if, if something's wrong in, in their lives, if they're missing classes or requesting more money um, for expenses, you know, being moody and to, just silent when they talk about school. These are some things to look out for. We also do have a, a dry week um, from uh, the, now this date will change, but the first week of school from move in to a week after that um, is a dry week. So we don't have any alcohol at our events for the first week of, of campus because we want people to be able to make friends. Now, I'm sure that they snuggle into the rooms, but they're supposed to be a dry week. Um, you know, I'm sure that they're going to Gatineau and, and drinking. I'm sure that they're going downtown for sure. And then so these are questions people say like, oh, is it really a dry week? Come on now. But the idea is that we we want them to try and make friends um, without needing substances. None of our events are focused around substances and we load events up. There are things happening all the time on campus. We um, start them off their first morning together. This thing I do called bang and brunch, all about learning to have the best sex of your life. But it's really about having conversations about consent, safety, healthy sexual relationships, uh, using substances safely. What is wasted sex and why is it risky? And all of those conversations happen the first morning that our students are there and waking up. Um, and so, you you know, we're, we're loading them with events and, and we're not including alcohol in those events because we want them to be able to develop relationships without needing that. Um, and so really just, you know, writing this letter, it doesn't have to be the exact same. And if folks want, I can share this with them. But the idea is that um, by talking to those uh, people close to them, they're able to have that open conversation. So if something does happen where they're concerned, um, the, the parents or caregivers have already had that conversation. And um, the person knows like, okay, this is something I can talk about with them, right? And so we're making it easy for them to be able to actually have the conversation. Uh, one of the other things too is, I know I've talked about a lot of stuff today. Uh, we do have the Umbrella Project uh, Harm Reduction Toolkit online. I'm gonna just grab the link and send it to you as well um, in the chat. So the um, we have this learning portal. Um, it's free to access and... Uh, um, here is the toolkit. So the toolkit really just goes over um, uh, harm reduction framework for post-secondary institutions. Um, what you can do, uh, there's individual approaches, um, harm reduction best practices, environmental approaches. So uh, I know I've talked a lot today. Um, we'll be able to share this PowerPoint with folks, no problem. I just saw that in the question in the chat. Um, but there's there's different areas and it. it gives you the tools to be able to actually access and look at those. Um, so we're not just leaving you like, okay, Sarah said to do all these things. I don't know how to do them. Um, they're on there. We've got it in there. But also there's some two trainings as well. Um, we have one, the Umbrella Project online training. So if you click that link, at the top it says home umbrella project online training uh, which and you can go through that and then we've got one called stigma substances and mental health 101 um and so yeah those three different things are, are going to be very helpful and a good place for you to start to know like the little things that you can do in, on your campus that will be important and effective for you as well um and yeah so i i went about five minutes less than I had anticipated, but 
Um, that's, that's about all I have today. There's, I mean, lots of other things that I didn't think of. I didn't really show much of our social media and stuff. We have really great team who does all that for us. So I'm very blessed to have them, but if there's anything that you're looking for or need, please feel free to reach out to me and project project at omahomecollege.com. I'm happy to send the resources, um, and, and share those with you as well. And if we have any questions, please ask now. Um, we are happy to chat and answer anything, but I really want this to be beneficial and, and helpful of how you can translate this into your own institution and not leave here being afraid and saying like, I don't know what to do. And that doesn't help. So all the things that we have, you're able to use, you just have to also seek permission from the third parties that we borrowed them from or, or adapted them with. Um, and yeah, we're, we're happy to, to share everything that we have. Fabulous. Thanks so much. That was excellent, Sarah. Thank oh. you for uh, for all of that information, which was so much information, a but lot. I'm sure that everybody got a lot out of it. <laughs> um, so um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll just um, ask you some myself. Okay, um, good. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll wait for some people to, uh, to submit some questions to our Q&A function, which as a reminder, everybody is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so, uh, one thing that I was wondering, Sarah, as I, as you were talking at the end about, um, that letter that you send out to parents, which sounds like such a fantastic, uh, resource. I'm wondering whether you ever get any kind of negative feedback from parents with that. No, we haven't oh, heard wow. any. Yeah. No. Yeah. So our residents actually sends it out and, but they're very, we work with them very well and very closely. Um, the manager, Brittany sends it out for us. So. We, I've never heard any negative feedback or any negative things from it. Now I'm sure there's parents who are like, oh, come on, like whatever. And, and not all of them probably read it to their students, but why not send it? It's easy. It's free. It doesn't change anything, uh, you know, to do it. It's not hard. And so that way we are just, you know, giving them some advice and information to, to kind of get started. But yeah, so far we've heard no negative stuff which is great. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's great news. Yeah. Um, good to hear that parents are on board with, uh, with harm reduction. So that's, I mean, that's awesome I hope to so. hear. <laughs> yeah, you would hope. Yeah. Um, fabulous. Um, my next question is, um, I'm curious where, uh, you get your harm reduction tips from. Is there a resource that you, um, like to access to, to access these kinds of tips? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ones. I think they're even listed in the toolkit. Let me just check as well. Um, there's a couple of different sources. So I didn't start this project from scratch. So we had uh, two amazing individuals, Polly and Amanda, who started the Umbrella Project from scratch um, through a grant that we received, uh, which was amazing. And I'm, I'm so happy that they're there. Um, we use a, a bunch of different um, places where we do our research from, but um, there's some different checklists that, that you can get, um, to see if your campus is, is accessing those, um, hang on. Uh, I'm just trying to get the name of it. Um, so we've got like different places and stuff, um, that, that we can use, uh, the CCSA, um, is one of the best resources that, that you can find. Um, they have so much great marketing material. Um, and we take a lot of our, our information from them, especially, uh, our lower risk guidelines, uh, a lot of the new cannabis research and stuff coming out of them. We've adapted that and given that to our students as well. Um, and then PEPA, um, is another thing that we have, um, participated in. Um, and so, uh, PEPA is the post-second Secondary education partnership alcohol harms um and so they're another place that we we get information i can send all these links in the chat as well um but it's all about post-secondaries and and using uh, alcohol in the safer way um but but we've really just adapted different things throughout the time. Like we've seen something like, oh, we think this is cool. Um, reach out to them and say, hey, we were wondering if we could adapt this thing or that thing. Um, so it's sort of just like seeing things that we think look cool and, and making them look like something our students would be interested in. Um, and so it's not really like a one, like, oh, we had this framework and now we're just going to use that. Um, yeah, this... I think, I know I didn't really answer the question, but. No, I think that's great. I think you answered the question excellently. Okay, good. <laughs> um, cool. So um, 
one other thing I was wondering about um, that I'll ask you about while we're waiting for, for more questions to come in. Reminder, guys, uh, Sarah's totally here for your questions. Please submit your questions if you have any. Um, but uh, I was curious whether you have any particular stories, like success stories or exciting, like, um, stories of somebody who um, who learned a lot or, or gained a lot from the Umbrella Project? Yeah, so I feel like our placement students get like the most out of our projects. They always come up with like really fantastic ideas. Um, but but oftentimes just after we, you know, go into a classroom, the discussion after is amazing. And it's a place where they're like, okay, we've had these conversations and now we're able to like open up. And a lot of people will talk about, um, you know, the experiences they've had with their family or friends um, and why they want to get involved or, you know, why they want to participate or volunteer. We had one student and he was in the public relations program and they had to raise money for a charity. And his brother had died of an overdose and he wanted to to get all of the funding for the umbrella project and I was like we don't need the funding but how about you find a, a local addiction service who does and so he had like wanted to participate in all this kind of stuff for that throughout the year and raised tons of money and stuff so you know I think that there are lots of great students who are keyed in we also get a lot of fantastic feedback from our students who are in recovery um, whatever that looks like for them uh, we get a lot of really great feedback of like wow I wish I had had this when I was in post-secondary the first time or wow I wish when I was 18 you know I'm coming back as a mature student um, I really wish that that this was something that we were able to access so it's really nice to hear that I know that we've got really good feedback from our students who are going to all people all pathways because um, a lot of them have said like I don't feel like I belong in a traditional 12-step um, program or abstinence-only program. Uh, I want to be able to um, come to a place where, you know, we can have these conversations without needing to abstain. I'm not ready to abstain. I don't want to. That doesn't fit my lifestyle. But I just want to be with people who understand and get it. And so that's other great feedback that we've also received, for sure. Cool. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. So it looks like we got a couple questions Good. coming in. Thank goodness. Um, so uh, thank you to this anonymous attendee who uh, sent in these questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, did you encounter a lot of barriers or people who were against harm reduction? Not really. Like, uh, so uh, to be fair, when this first started, there were people on campus who would say like, our students aren't using substances because they're in post-secondary and post-secondary students don't use substances. To which case I'm like, have you ever watched a movie in your life? Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and like, if you, uh, if you consume social media, anyways, have you seen fraternity parties and have you seen other things? But, but a lot of our students were like, our people were like, not a lot. P there were some people who were like, oh, our students aren't using substances because they're in post-secondary. And I think a lot of people are like, sure, our students drink, but they wouldn't do cocaine or, you know, they wouldn't do other things. And we're like, yeah, they are though. And, and that's fine. And that's okay. And, and we want to support them still. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think those are sort of the barriers that happen when, when this project first set out there, there's not a lot of people giving negative feedback now. Um, you know, when we had our first young person overdose death, um, and the community was like, oh my gosh, young people, it's in the drug supply, blah, blah, blah. Like our, our school paid, I think it was like $12,000 to get naloxone kits before they were free in Ontario, the nasal ones, uh, in all places where students hung out. So we had them in residence, we had them in anywhere there's food, uh, the um, gyms, the um, uh, concert hall, like anywhere that students were Starbucks, anywhere. Um, we had them there because we knew that, that it was important, the library, you know, anything like that. Um, so our, our school has been like very keyed in. Uh, there's still a lot of schools who won't even let naloxone be on campus. And so our school has been always like very positive harm reduction based, uh, which is honestly why I like working there. It's I'm, I have, there's no one that's like, oh, you can't do that. Or that's too progressive. Um, you know, we, we run events like we were running one just last week called pot and plants where we talk about pot and we made a herb garden um, and it wasn't a cannabis garden, but, you know, just the symmetry of it was like dill and oregano and stuff. But, um, you know, doing those crafts and stuff, bring a lot of students in. They're not coming to hear what you want to talk about, but they're they stay for it. So we call them glitter and gab. We've been running them for um, the last well before even the pandemic. We've done lots of different ones and lots of different 
places. And during the pandemic, we would, I mailed home crafting kits once a month and had these conversations with our students. Um, so I don't really receive any barriers. There's, there's very few people, like I said, there are some who will say, oh, you're encouraging students to use drugs. And we're like, here's all the research that says otherwise. Um, but I am also very lucky in that I haven't had pushback from administration. I will say if you do that, you want to find your local um, champions in the, the post-secondary to help you um, get through that. Our director of student support service is great. Our VP, our president is all great. But if they weren't, I would, you know, try and get that educational piece in of like why this is and show them the research, show them this statistics, show them the NACHA, show them the CPADS data, show them um, that our students are using substances and that they're having negative consequences and talk about retention. All they care about oftentimes, not all they care about, but a lot of times it, it comes down to, to money and finances and student retention. And if our students are, are not experiencing or having positive experiences at post-secondary, they're more likely to drop out. And so if you want them to have a better experience, talk about how we can keep them retained. And that's through providing these types of services as well. Fabulous. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, okay, and our uh, our next question is, do you have volunteer opportunities for your students to take part in some of these harm reduction initiatives? Yeah, so I don't really take volunteers because I just, if I had a big event and then we needed them, I would, I do, I did take them like pre-pandemic when we would run like really large scale events, you know, one day we did like 300 candles in a candle making workshop for our AC day one, which is our orientation. Um, I, but I like crazy challenges like that. And so, but I find it's easier for me to take placement students because you can train them throughout the year instead of just like a drop in. Like if you just need hands, then placement, then volunteers are good. The one thing I'll say is that working in a, a college is more challenging to have volunteers. So if you worked in a post-secondary university where your students are there for four years, sometimes six, eight, you know, if they're 10, even if they're going to do an undergrad, master's, med school or a PhD, you know, you could have them for years. The college, a lot of programs are one year, most are two years. So there's a lot of turnover. And so it's hard to get our students to volunteer and stay for long periods of time. That is one place that the universities have an advantage over us 100%. Um, and so like, I feel like it's easier to get those volunteers to want to do this stuff um, if you are able to access them uh, in a university. In the college setting, we take a lot more placement students. So our social service work program, our victimology program, our child and youth care programs, those are our nursing program, really great places for us to take our students from. Um, the social service work program and the child and youth care program, it's three days a week um, for a whole year. And so, uh, and they're, they're flipped. So it's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in one and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the other. Um, and so if you just take two students and you have a student for the whole year um, to, to be able to run the programs and stuff. So if you don't have funding, um, it's not necessarily volunteers, but placement students are great. The volunteers I find are a lot harder to keep motivated. So um, I, we instead go with the placement students a lot of sense yeah. yeah yeah fantastic oh and looks like we got one more question that snuck in here all right um do you have one harm reduction event that has stuck out as having most success and is there somewhere you get creative inspiration for these types of events so I love events and that's just how my brain works and so I love planning events I love running like at least one large event almost every week um I love spending money on buying things and doing things and like everyone jokes that Amazon comes to my office every week. Um, and so I love plenty of events. So I would say our biggest ones that have been really successful are the ones that we call Glitter and Gab that we're running. Um, those are very good. We, we do arts and crafts. And so even like our AC day one orientation, um, we would do like a thousand tie dye t-shirts in a day. And so we would put like just a little logo on the bottom 
Um, but you don't even have to, you can get the shirts like $3. So actually sometimes Dollar Tree has a lot of white t-shirts, but, um, for like a dollar 25, but if you can get bulk t-shirts cheap and then just buy the tie dye, that's a great way to say, okay, Hey, you want a shirt? Okay. We'll take 10 people at a time. And I'm going to have this conversation with you and here's what it is. And so sometimes our conversation would be like about how to help a friend who's been sexually assaulted. And sometimes it would be about like how to party safely this weekend in the lead up to Halloween or St. Patrick's day. And so the crafts are a great way to get people in a lot of people think like oh not everyone's going to want to attend but we get all kinds of people it's it's not just more like our female uh, students like a lot of people like oh isn't it more drawn to them it's not like a lot of people come um sometimes we've had like three four hundred students in the audience wanting to part or like wanting to participate in making like glitter jars or um t-shirts we've done a thousand t-shirts in a day so those crafts are really good and then our fair days are really good and so we give everyone like a little postcard they fill it out out. Um, they get a t-shirt or a box of candy and then I'll like on Black Friday buy like a Keurig or a TV or something for like $100, $200 and give that out as a big prize and the students will do like anything for a prize like that. On Black Friday you should be buying everything that you can find um, and that's what we give out throughout the year and um, that's been a great thing for us as well. So I would say that but but make them work for it like get the postcard, get them to get six stamps, go to the different tables um, and it also makes it look a lot more busy and then a lot more people are going through and so we would get anywhere between pre-pandemic um like 200 and like 450 students in like the three hours we were there come through and talk to people and have those conversations so I would say those are our best events for sure Fabulous. that sounds like an incredible event um and I honestly the glitter and gab sounds like something I would even want to go to <laughs> I love crafts and that's why I was like yeah. joking I was like oh, I'm gonna turn but like this is like my crafting station where I like put everything together <laughs> and it was too messy so I was like I have to change the background but <laughs> I love doing that but not everyone's brain works that way so find something else we also do one called spill the tea where every week we give people a ten dollar gift card for for Starbucks for coming and we have conversations about sexual health substance use and mental health and it's me and the group counselor so you know spill the tea is like a fun take on like uh, sharing gossip and the students come and have really open and honest conversations. So those are probably like best events. We also do like some stuff on Instagram and Facebook. I can send those uh, in the chats as well, our, our links to social, but, um, but yeah, it's just like try and do some stuff, see what works for you. Um, and if things don't go the way you want, just adapt them. And, you know, I, not all my events were successful in the beginning, but I've been here for six years now and I've kind of got a better handle on, on what our students tend to like. Okay. Well, that's perfect timing. Um, we've got three minutes left. So, um, this was excellent. This was an excellent uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, having come in and talked to us about all of this. I feel like everybody here got a ton of learning today. Um, thank you so much to our audience for having stuck around and uh, joined us for this fantastic uh, webinar. Um, our next webinar is going to be on the topic of social prescribing. Um, so if you have any kind of interest in social prescription, um, we highly recommend that you come out to that. Um, social prescribing is this idea of um, combining the worlds of prescribing and social determinants of health and really how we can um, bring those things together. So um, we hope that you'll join us for that. Uh, and once again, just a reminder to please fill out our survey. Um, oh, and uh, I will share that uh, the, the presentation uh, slides will be shared on our website once I get those from Sarah, um, and this recording will be available on our website as well um, for, uh, for you to, to watch uh, afterwards. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day.